Why did the Supreme Court, now I can say, oh, look how bad those nine guys were. But of course, they often say the Supreme Court follows the election returns. And the context for this retreat, in the, particularly in the 1890s, was a reorientation of the whole country, really, in its political and uh, racial attitudes. The 1890s is not just the decade of segregation, but of the final implementation of the reservation system for Indians, Chinese exclusion. In other words, racial lines are being drawn all over the place, nationally, not just in the South. It's also the decade of the Spanish-American War, where the United States embarks on its imperial adventure under the banner of the white man's burden. Coming from a poem by Rudyard Kipling, you know, take up the white man's burden. The United States must take up the responsibility for ruling over non-white peoples. The white man's burden was a very popular uh, kind of trope at this time. Let me show you an ad here. Here, Piers Soap. This is an ad. The first step toward lightning is through the teaching the virtue of cleanliness. This is an ad for soap as the white man's burden. The text that goes along with it, by the way, you can see there's battleships up at the top, various kinds, and on the bottom right is a missionary handing soap to a scantily clad native somewhere. This is just a, you know, this is the civilizing mission of the United States in the Philippines, in Cuba, places like that. But it's within this racial term of the white man's burden. The white man must bring civilization to non-whites. Um, th so this is a period of triumphant racism, north and south, uh, in the 1890s and early 20th century. Last week we saw a couple of chapters of David Blight's book, Race and Reunion, where he argued that, that, that this racial ideology was part of the process of national reconciliation among whites, north and south. The decline of what he calls the emancipationist vision of the Civil War, focusing on slavery, its replacement by what he called the reconciliationist idea that both sides were fighting for noble causes, both had heroic soldiers, and each could respect the other, and the, and the word slavery sort of eliminated. Here's an um, excellent visual image of this notion Blight's talking about of reconciliation. This is at the time of the Spanish-American War. You see two soldiers, one in gray, one in blue, shaking hands in front of an American flag. The girl has a little thing on her head saying Cuba with a broken chain. See, the United States has liberated Cuba. The young, I don't know what you want to say about her, but she's a young, nice, cute girl who is Cuba. And she has been freed by the united efforts of the North and the South to, this is reconciliation. Northerners and Southerners fighting together this time not against each other, but fighting together in the, in the Spanish-American War. Um, so the retreat from Reconstruction, in other words, went hand in hand with um, the resurgence of a very narrow, racially inflected view of American citizenship and American nationality. And the, um, the language of race suffused uh, American public discourse in the early 20th century. People talked about race conflict, race problems, the different races. The Dillingham Commission on Immigration in, the, in 1911 or 13 published a list of the hundred races of man. They divided mankind into a hundred races with, and in order. They knew exactly who was number 52, who was number 68. Number one was the white man. The bottom were blacks. And then in between were all sorts of others. Southern Italians were pretty close down to the bottom also. But all the, so the, the world is composed of races. This is the idea. And that is the key quality in understanding people's capacities. Race was invoked to explain everything from people's standard of living to their capacity to partic participate in democracy, their propensity toward criminality, and many, many other things. So the boundaries of nationhood expanded so dramatically um, in the aftermath of the Civil War, contracted 
uh, very dramatically in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, the social movements that had helped to expand the 19th century definition of freedom had to deal with this, had to redefine themselves in order to fit within the new intellectual and institutional framework. So the Knights of Labor, the labor movement, which had opened its doors to blacks, is replaced by the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, which is racially exclusive and has virtually no interest in non-white or immigrant members. The women's movement, in reviving the demand for the vote, uh, makes its peace with nativism and racism. A new generation of women suffrage leaders like Carrie Chapman Catt um, insist that enfranchising the former slaves had been a big mistake and that giving native-born white women the right to vote would override the influence of blacks and immigrants. And when women's suffrage does come in 1920, the largest expansion of democracy in our history, it is carefully calibrated so it doesn't affect black women in the South. And the women's suffrage movement accepts that. The only way to get women, the women's suffrage amendment um, ratified in enough southern legislatures to get up to three quarters of the states is to acknowledge that the restrictions on black voting will remain. They will now apply to black women as well as black men. So I'm not trying to just criticize the women. All these movements have to deal with the new racially uh, uh, inflected policies of, uh, of the early uh, 20th century.